Hello, everyone. This is Professor Hamamoto. It is October 12, year 2021, 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Welcome to my show. I hope you're in a festive mood today because we're going to have a gay old time today. It's going to be full of hearts and flowers. And um, as you saw by the description, I'm going to be dealing with the uh, homoerotic Ephib subculture, or maybe it's the dominant culture, but it's the homoerotic Ephib subculture and the military university spy complex. Yes, military university. They have merged. They have fused. And uh, this is part of the lesson, hopefully, that we'll draw from this one particular incident that took place in Washington, D.C. not too long ago during the so-called J6 event where some, uh, I don't know, an ordinary citizen um, must not have been from the security services or so-called intelligence, but they took a shot of uh, six or more gentlemen. I think they looked to be in their 30s or so, wearing their tight muscle-type shirts and their butt-tight uh, Bermuda shorts and their Sperry topsiders or whatever else uh, they wear on Fire Island during the summertime or in West Hollywood or in uh, the Castro, I don't know. Um, probably DuPont Square is more like it since they're in the uh, DC area, if you catch my meaning, if you catch my drift. So we're gonna be dealing with that, but before we go into it, uh, it's gonna be a detailed and a long and extensive talk here, and I'm gonna try to get as much uh, through, through of it, uh, through the material here as much as I can uh, in this one hour. I might have to revisit it later, but that's okay. Um, welcome, the gold color. Welcome, Melissa Fern. How are you today? Good. Uh, Disinformation. Uh, no, you're from Mexico. Great. Might be a good place to be right now with the meltdown in America. Carol, how are you doing? All in, all the sun. Hello. Akaida TV. Yeah, Masaki Miyagawa is here. By the way, that's one of his art pieces right here. And uh, the... Um, pyramid there. So if you want to check that out, hit uh, Akaida TV. And then there's Trapaskunk, Tamrak. I'm sorry if I can't really read it here. It's a very small print. Ecat, hi, how are you? Ayape, Melissa, I think I might have... Oh, David, uh, Diamond Dave, Dapper Dave, Diamond Dave from Detroit, Underdown. How are you? Michael Charlie, Ecat, Piper, how are you? Ayape. 96 tears, question mark, and the Mysterians are here. Bo Williams, Corky Goss, hi. And uh, Yoganart, howdy. Okay, I'm going to start now and um, do a deep dive into this homoerotic subculture, which, of course, uh, we're talking about the, P, uh, the FBI. It was there at the inception of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, because most of you know the backstory about one John Edgar Hoover, or as he liked to be known professionally, J. Edgar Hoover, he had a long-term relationship with his chief assistant by the name of Mr. Clyde Tolson. And uh, let's just be honest about it. They were a gay couple, right? That's cool. You know, this is, <laughs> this is like early days, right? This is before gay liberation. And uh, this is before the coming out of, of the CIA and FBI's basically being a, a homosexual uh, organization of good old, not good old boys, but white shoe boys who come out of this uh, public school tradition, hearkening back to British intelligence, transferred to the Anglo-American world, where the bonds of their class are effected through sexual exchange, primarily boy-boy uh, male, male, and later on, Ephib, and that's what that means. That's why I'm taking this time to explain the backstory here. Ephib means a teenage boy, right? And the patron I'm referring to is typically an, an older male patron or mentor, right? And this harkens back historically. There's tons of academic literature written on this. And of course, anecdotally, it's pretty wide known that much of uh, the latter part of the Roman uh, society 
Uh, it's usually associated with decadence, not to place any value judgment on it, because you can still go to Rome and see all the ruins there, just like maybe uh, 500 years from now, uh, people will come to visit what was once America and look at our ruins, right? So uh, you have Roman culture specifically, um, including the, the poets, Horace, for example, in the Odes, uh, glorifying the, the male uh, sexuality, this budding sexuality, I suppose, of the teenage boy, I guess 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, maybe even up into the young adult range. And pedophile and uh, and uh, ephebophile and hebophile, they're, they're, they tend to be conflated, but there's there's a distinction between the three uh, that are made by, by the experts. So, when, and this complicates the matter here because if you are a older male having a sexual relationship with an ephebe who is 18 years or older, which in most states qualifies that young man to be a adult, a consenting adult, then it's not illegal, right? So far, and there are groups that are trying to change that, pedophilia is illegal. It's, it's a criminal act. Um, hebophiles, that's, I think it's kind of an intermediate tweener age. I'm not really sure, and, and experts aren't really sure either. It's kind of preteen, but after the, a, a young child, there's kind of a hebophile category there. But the the uh, ephebe culture I'm going to be talking about today, and, and um, as I'll uh, chiming in, I'll be chiming in uh, periodically. I, I got uh, to witness it at my own institution of the University of California, Davis. And um, that bit of an autobiographical information is important only because it's uh, universal. Uh, that's how the, the contemporary university runs. It's, ver it's very open. It's very upfront. Uh, it's very uh, overt. But the difference that that I'm going to bring to the understanding today is, is to show how that EFI subculture, they call it GLBTQ because it has to have some sort of academic connection there, but it's an EFI culture. And by the way, it's more prevalent. The EFI culture, man on man homosexuality is much more prevalent than, than the lesbian, the female and female. And, and there is sex abuse and there is um, sexual exploitation of heterosexual professors and administrators and counselors, therapists, coaches uh, against sexual violence against women. Um, that's you know, but that gets the exclusive attention. So I'm going to be uncovering a, a dimension of the university that requires, that demands more attention. Um, not only because it's being ignored, but because it really strikes at the heart of what is happening today in 2021 with all the different crises that we're being hit with. And most of you who are watching this channel, at least, know by now that these are synthetic events, as they've been called. These are artificial. They're, they're not coming from an act, acts of God or, or crawling out of the jungles or coming from patient zero or from green monkeys. These are engineered events socially and biosocially and uh, beyond. Uh, because after all, the university is, is where all these major disciplines from biology, social science, behavioral sciences, and the arts, this is where it all comes together in one geographic space. So it's understandable why institutions like the FBI, the Office of Naval Intelligence, the Central Intelligence Agency, these are just the American ones, right? Uh, we, we can talk about the KSB, we can talk about Mossad, we can talk about uh, Sudete of uh, France, all the major nations, even maybe even some of the second world or third world nations, so-called, uh, have operations here in the United States. Uh, this book in particular talks about one case study of a woman who was a Cuban spy. And uh, before I started reading about Cuban intelligence, only recently has that information been starting to be published, I, I, like most people, I said, what, Cuban intelligence? That doesn't really seem to make any sense. But indeed, uh, Cuba, uh, the island nation of Cuba, which is, uh, uh, in truth, a, a U.S., still a U.S.-run operation, right? They kicked the mafia out, but the, the corporations took over, and, and the intelligence operation still, still uh, run, runs it behind the scenes there. But uh, from the get-go, uh, Cuba has always had very, very good intelligence. And I kind of figured why that is. That's because they're an arm of our own American 
uh, intelligence, and this is how they pass information back. This is how they manage to keep tensions high about a phony uh, Cold War, as it used to be called, and most people have seen through it by now, so they keep fabricating new enemies uh, uh, near and far, and if uh, we run out of those, then we'll just go into the biological world and find enemies there threatening to destroy uh, human civilization. So you can see by my introduction here that the topic is wide ranging. There are many, any number of sub themes, but again, the main focus today is to show the, the collaboration, the confluence, the coming together, if you'll pardon the pun, between the homoerotic ephebe culture, which is cultivated in probably as early as K through 12, but definitely at the university, it's, it's a program, and how that articulates with the military university spy, uh, spy complex and the different alphabet agencies that uh, uh, have been fused together under the reorganization plan after 9-11. Uh, and by the way, 9-11, as most of you know, was the signal pretext, right? The dividing line. Philip Haney, I did a talk on him earlier, talks about this as being the signal moment in in American, if not uh, you know, current uh, civilizational history. And I agree with that. Primarily because this is when this structure, this system became truly institutionalized and a new generation of of uh, law enforcement, if you call them, or intelligence agency was recruited. And they've been recruited aggressively from the GLBTQ ranks, which have been groomed and pushed forward by all the major institutional recruiting grounds of, of these agencies, which I'll get to uh, in a moment. So all this was going through my mind <laughs> when I saw this, this uh, photo that I have on uh, my channel here. Everybody's seen it by now, I think. Right there, <laughs> I mean, that is so queer. The queer. I mean, that is a, that was a flaming photo, and you know, you can say that these days because we've been through, you know, the gay liberation. More power to you. Yeah, yeah. You know, have your parades. Go to go to all public events. Go to the supermarket. Go to the movie theater. Uh, get married. Whatever it is you like to do. However, do not sell out the United States of America. Do not uh, spy on citizens and um, try to cut back a little bit on the high level structural corruption. I know it exists. Right. And I I'm, remember, I'm friendly to the intelligence agency. I'm friendly to organized crime. <laughs> right. I understand that we need a lot of, uh, you know, darkness in order that the civilizational light can be allowed to to glow and to shine. You know, I've talked about, you know, a low level mobster like Morris Levy. I mean, this guy is a patron of the American art. We would not have modern jazz without the the gangster Morris Levy. I wish we had more of them today rather than these guys uh, wearing Abercrombie and Fitch or J. Crew or um, LL Bean wear, which is fine. I'm not knocking your fashion sense because, you know, you got your uh, Terrios, you got your hip hoppers that's sagging, you know, with their underwear showing and they got the dreads. But then, you know, they're also assets. They're also snitches. Uh, they come in all shapes, genders, uh, persuasions, uh, religions. Now, that's that's really the, you know, I guess the the end point of the equality revolution. Now, everybody gets to be a snitch. And a rat, right? Unfortunately, that's not what I was hoping for when I was working uh, toward that end. I was hoping for a society that was uh, based on freedom and uh, uh, creativity and all the other goodness of what we like to think is Americana, true Americana. Being a snitch and being a rat, being surveilled, being bossed around, being oppressed and um, being uh, f continually frightened to death uh, is not the American way of life. This goes counter to every single e ethos or, or ethic that, that we enjoy here in, um, in the United States of America and in other parts of the world, which is why they're attacking us, because we're a bad example of a good example of how civilizations can rise um, up through your own individual, non-connected, creativity initiative you can rise right so they got to clamp down because the middle classes wow they're always they're always a problem for the ruling people um even though they need our brain power our intelligence our creativity to keep the machine running so um 
you know, like like you, I had probably a traditional understanding of what of what, what spying was, right? It was what we saw on TV, the baby boomers, right? You had the man from Uncle on TV. That was 64 to 68, a, a turbulent time, assassination after one after another, assassination of our beloved Irish American martyred president, John Fitzgerald Kennedy in 1963, November. Uh, then we had our, our, our Gandhi, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. And I've spoken of these assassinations earlier, so I'm not going to belabor it. This is 1968. And uh, four months after that, our other, um, he would have, I assume, become the next president of the United States. I'm speaking of uh, Robert Kennedy, Robert Kennedy Sr. And he was gunned down four months after um, Martin Luther King Jr. But as a kid growing up in that in that time, and of course, there are people like Malcolm X, whatever you feel about him, he's an important political figure. And then over, overseas, of course, people like uh, uh, No Diem, Diem down in um, uh, South Vietnam, the, the president of South he he was assassinated shortly before um, President Kennedy was assassinated, and Patrice Lumumba, on, on and on, right? There's a whole list. But as a kid growing up, you don't associate that with coming from your own institutions, your own government, your own central intelligence agency, agency your own FBI, your own judiciary, which helped uh, uh, collude. They colluded in the cover-up and the rewriting of history, which is where your academic historians uh, come in, right? Um, you don't associate it, and certainly I didn't. I'm not going to claim any sort of a preternatural insight or... Um, sophistication or maturity in um, understanding that most of the problem is, is self-generated. It's coming from the United States of America, and it's coming from a certain constellation of people uh, related to banking families and, and capital, right? I'm not anti-capitalist, but these are high-level uh, capitalists, and, and you can't really call them capitalists. They're monopolists, right? They're monopoly men. These are the bankers, right? You figure that out later. I didn't even get much of it in college, and I was a you know, a political science major. I thought I was on the way to law school, right? Uh, yeah, certainly you had the radical uh, professor uh, who got a PhD at Berkeley or something, and typically they got them out pretty quickly. But uh, you didn't, at least I didn't learn very much uh, at the undergraduate level. Uh, I really didn't start uh, understanding this process until I was at the early stage uh, of my graduate career. And I'll just tell you before I go into the topic itself, I don't want to take too much time out of biographical information here, but I just wanted to impress upon the audience here, the, the signal event of meeting uh, Mark Lane. He's the author of Rush to Judgment. I think it's out of print now, but you can find used copies on the retailer that ate the universe. Uh, it was published in 1966. And the uh, uh, Kennedy assassination, as it happened in 63, and then you had the Warren Commission uh, between those times. So this is one of the first, if not the first major book that was criticizing the official Warren report. And for that reason and many more, this is an important book that needs to be read today. So I met him. A visiting professor was a friend of Mark Lane. He was passing through town. And this is before the VHS uh, tape machine, certainly before the age of, uh, of laptop computers. So he brought in a 16 millimeter projector and he brought his little canister, his, his um, film can that had a 16 millimeter copy of the famed Zapruder film. Or, you know, you've seen it, right? Multiple times and maybe hundreds of times of um, our beloved martyred president getting his head shut off or shot off rather. And uh, you know the rest. There's been movies, books, uh, monographs, conferences, on and on. I'm not, I'm not trivializing. I'm saying that it's part of our popular culture, right? So I got to meet Mark Lane and uh, I just so happened to have a copy of this book, which I found used upstairs in my office. I shared a, an office uh, well, I think I had my own office. I was a teaching assistant. at uh, This is at UC Irvine. So I ran up and got it, and I had him sign it. And so uh, I still have a copy of the, the paperback version. But you can tell by my this encounter here, I already had been thinking about 
assassination and the true history of the American Republic. So that's when I really kind of got my start. I was in my 20s. And so it started very early. I've been doing this for decades now. And um, I'm continually uh, refining my analysis as more literature comes out. Oh, speaking of literature and books, I'm reading this right now. I just acquired it. Thank you, patrons, for allowing me to purchase these, these books. And I'm still very much committed to physical, intellectual property books, records, CDs, DVDs. Uh, the Girl uh, is the main title, A Life in the Shadow of Roman Polanski. And it's not what I thought it might be. She's not necessarily a defender of Polanski, but she's not one of the people who are using him as a means to push their own political agenda while letting everything else just kind of fall by the wayside. So it's a kind of, it's a nuanced argument. I, I want to share it with you a little bit later on, but I have to, I have to go through it very closely. Today, of course, I'm going to be focusing on this particular book by Daniel Golden, Spy Schools is the title and the subtitle you might not be able to read. It says, how the CIA, FBI, and foreign intelligence secretly exploit America's universities. So you're saying, oh, yeah, of course, we know about the OSS. We saw the movie as Constant Gardner. We read the book and we've read our CIA history and we know about the white shoe boys and Yale and Skull and Bones. Good for you. Good. I'm not going to go over that area. All right. So don't worry about it. I'm going to present 95 percent new novel information, 100 percent filtered through my original insights. That's what differentiates me. That's what distinguishes me from your average tube Uber, right? I'm not a tube Uber. Uh, I, I, my career is doing, making, uh, doing original research. My career is not Googling information and, and then spitting it back out at, at you and calling it research. That's not me. You got the wrong channel. Uh, maybe that's why my subscriptions are just like it's 7.2, which leads me to ask you, get your friends and neighbors and family dog to subscribe to this channel. Better yet, subscribe to my Patreon, because a lot of material, as you know, people who've been kind of holding back and not joining, you're going to get a lot of good material there. Not just more of me talking, but printed material, PDFs. I'm doing some audio uh, starting in the early 2022. I'll, I'll be doing some music electronic music and I'm, I'm experimenting with the frequencies here so on and on that's my sales pitch for today so um i've been at it quite a while so when i read this book i said okay i'm gonna read it sort of cross grain what is golden daniel golden here telling us here that takes us to a new level of understanding and what is he omitting not necessarily uh, consciously or through malicious um, misdirection. But what can I add to the to the insights? And I'm going to try here to, uh, to add some new insights that he might not understand. By the way, just to show you that he's uh, golden, Daniel Golden is not just some uh, schmo off the street. Uh, he won the Pulitzer Prize in 2004 for a book that he did on uh, elite education. It's called The Price of Admission. Now, I haven't read the book, but I think I should, because there was a scandal recently. Uh, it, you know, it's been going on for years. I'm sure since the beginning of of um, college and university was a certain deal, degree of selectivity is involved, especially, and it's even worse today, right? Because now it, it, people are competing with an international student body, which Golden gets into. So he has, so he's a legitimate journalist for whatever it's worth. He got the Pul Pulitzer Prize. That commands respect uh, for me, at least. And uh, I think today, you know, this book came out in, what, 2018, so it might have changed. But according to this book, he's a senior editor, editor at uh, ProPublica. And I get uh, their material every once in a while. I can't really remember. I think it's a nonpartisan kind of left liberal. Uh, I wouldn't call it a, a, a news site, but it's sort of more like editorial type pieces and commentary is more is more like it. But that's where Golden is, right? So I tend to, for me, he has a, a good deal of credibility with the types of insights he's sharing with us. And he's obviously done a great deal of research talking to people who I would never have access to. So he's walking that thin line between uh, the intelligence community. He has sources there and, and other Individual, I guess it's probably been cultivated through his network in in um, 
in doing journalist uh, journalist uh, work, right? <clears throat> um, I want to focus on one particular character, however, in this book that that's all over the map. It's focused, but it covers a wide area. But I want to just uh, home in on one particular character. And there's going to be a surprise ending to this. So hang on to the very end. See, I like to build the suspense. I'm into drama. I'm into theater, right? Yeah, but I'm not going to wear butt-tight Bermuda shorts and a muscle shirt right? and go out there in my little X-ray specs, my Ray-Bans, right? That prevents the, it scrambles, I think, the, the face recognition technology. That's my guess. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, Graham Spanier or Spanier. Maybe I should have looked him up on YouTube to see how he pronounce it. Uh, he probably pronounced it Spanier, Graham, or I don't know if it's Graham or Graham, but I'll just call him Graham Spanier. Maybe it's Graham Spanier. I, I don't know. But he's just, a, you know, a, an ordinary American. Uh, I think he got his degree at I, Iowa State and ag school, and I'm not I'm not sneering that. To me, you got to look at the ag schools. I've always made that argument. They're they're really where the action is, and that's where they like to recruit character, recruit individuals like Graham Spanier. Not necessarily from the Ivy League. I mean, you know, they they know about the white shoe boys. They want to get someone who's an up and comer, who's a striver, right? Who someone who wants to live down the fact that he came from a state university like Iowa State. And it's, you know, it's a cow town and they got an ag school and yeah, maybe every once in a while they'll field a good uh, basketball team, <clears throat> but it's not Ivy League, right? Not even close. And that's the type of social psychology that um, they're using. And right now, by the way, the social psychologists have said, go after the first generation college and university student. And that means Latina. And I say Latina because the Latino is going to fall by the wayside. It's going to be uh, Senora whoever that's going to run herd on uh, her people, the Latino immigrantes, right? The first generation. Um, and they're going to ride herd over the rest of us too, whether we be Japonesa or Chinitos or Anglos or Judeos or whoever it is. That's really the new... Um, Comprador class, or what I call them, servitors I meant bodies, has a Latina face. So if you like ALC, you're going to get, you know, AL no. Uh, very, very soon. It's already happening, okay? Uh, and I don't care who it is. It could be a brown face, could be a yellow face, it could be a black or a brown. It doesn't really matter to me. If you are going trying to run a power trip game on me, it's not going to happen, okay? <laughs> not this. This Japonesa, not this Chinito, okay? I don't play that. So warning to you that your little recruitment scheme is going to fail, right? Because, you know, my people ran you people off to shoot. You tried to invade Japon. You tried to, you know, you got your foothold in China. You got your foothold in so Southeast Asia. But we ran all your de Jesuit uh, rat finks. We ran you off the island, man. We ran you off. And we didn't have no cannons. We had no muskets. We just had our bare foot fist, and we had the will to resist you. So we're going to resist you here in America as well. And um, if you don't believe me, try, try, just try it. I love it. I just enjoy it. Um, that's it's just part of my life blood. And uh, this type of of uh, combat is also part of my uh, kobudo, as we call it in Okinawa. Kobudo in Chinese is a wushu, and that character means to stop fighting, be strong. And you fight, and then you won't have a fight. All right. So I serve as a gentleman. I serve you warning. I serve you warning. Listen up and learn. Let's work together. Remember, I have nothing against intelligence agency. I have nothing against uh, Latinas. I have nothing against uh, uh, the, the organized criminals or the street thugs. I want to work together. We all need each other. <laughs> Even squares like me. I understand how the world works, man. I'm grown up. I've been around, you know. Uh, we can all work through this together. Let's let's join forces instead of trying to pretend that we're enemies, okay? And while the people at the, the real banking found, they're just sitting back, oh, God, look at those assholes. They're just really, they're fighting amongst them. That's just the way we love it. So when I go in on Graham Spanier, the guy from the cornfields of Iowa, this is nothing personal, okay? I just understand the psychology. Because I'm one of those people. I come from dirt. 
right? I'm a striver. I'm a servitor of empire. At least they were trying to groom me to be one. They couldn't groom me to be a part of the, the gay CIA slash FBI wearing butt-tied Bermuda shorts, Sperry Topsiders, uh, Ray-Bans, and uh, a tight muscle shirt. They couldn't get me, but believe me, they tried. But since they couldn't, you know, they really had a hard time to really figure me out. So they just put me in the clown category, which is cool because, as I told you last time, I clowned them. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Enough with the rant. All right. So nothing against Graham Spanier, but he was the president of Pennsylvania State University. Right. Not Ivy League, but, you know, a major research one, we call it university. They get money from the federal government. They get money from the DOD and they get money from the DOD and they get money from the DO. It's mostly Pentagon. Right. The university fuse military university complex. Get get the idea. All of the universities have been been bought off and it fused with the Pentagon. The Pentagon has fused with NATO and it, and and the United Nations and the WHO and. Uh, back and forth, right? That's where it's at now. Of course, Golden couldn't get into that. I'm just providing the synthesis for you here. So Graham Spanier or Graham Spanier became the president of the Pennsylvania State University. Gosh, what a distinction that would be, especially if his own parents never went to college, right? I bet they were corn farmers or the hog sloppers, you know? So he's he's like a president, and now he's omnipotent, right? And uh, this uh, pro, the initial profile was done. Remember, hang on, I got a surprise ending about Mr. or, or Doctor or Professor or President Grom Spanier at the end. Before we end, I'm going to show you that that you don't want to say yes <laughs> to these individuals, no matter how how big you think you are and you're going to go to the top and get out of the Iowa cornfields and become the president of the Pennsylvania State University or Harvard or Yale, whatever it is, you know, you're going to be knocked right down to where you came from because it doesn't, doesn't, this, this dream of, um, of upward mobility is limited. So um, Golden did a profile of uh, President <coughs> Spanier back in 2007 and he devoted an entire chapter, chapter seven, titled The CIA's Favorite <laughs> University President. I'm sorry, I'm laughing. Let me say it again. The CIA's Favorite University President. So why does he title this? Well, because uh, the author Gold, Golden says that it was Spanier that opened the gates publicly to let all these alphabet agencies just come waltzing in like they own the place. I mean, they do own the place. I already told you, it's a DOD operation, it's Pentagon, it's NATO. They already own the place, but there was an academic culture of resistance against snitch organizations, spy organizations, so-called law enforcement, so-called intelligence, and military. And that's a legacy of the 50s and the 1960s in particular, when your average undergraduate I'm talking about average undergraduate, not just someone who is following politics and living and breathing, but just the average uh, undergraduate through the 60s, just by default, had um, nothing but uh, disdain and suspicion of all the alphabet uh, agencies. Now, there were a few that did not. And Spanier, apparently, by his own description, is one of those people that had no problem with the FBI, the CIA, the U.S. Army, or whoever else was recruiting at Iowa State when he was an undergraduate. But, um, you know, I caught the tail end, end of it, but, uh, you know, the, the whole, the initials ROTC, Reserve Officer Training, I mean, gosh, you would never walk around a campus in your uniform and you'd never confess to anybody that you were in ROTC. Now it's it's um, integral. It's probably a control center to many of these, these institutions. Now it's not a big deal because there's been a, a generational changeover. All the people that went through the radicalization process uh, through the late 50s and 1960s, they've aged out, right? The professors are gone. They retired. They've been replaced by a new group of people who are fundamentally careerist uh, in uh, orientation and in behavior. And that includes people of color, by the way. You might see someone, a brown face, you know, in so-called Latino or Latinx, because, you know, there's been degendered. So it's Latinx studies. You may see a yellow person over at Asian American studies, you know, it, uh, let's say UC Davis, <clears throat> but it's it's that's deceptive. These are these this is a clown show, right? 
these are fronts and that's what we were uh, by the time I got there, there was it was kind of transforming. He said, "Okay, you know, you're here now. Thank us for that. You know, you you worked your way in. Congratulations. Uh, now you're going to have to work for us." And I said, "Gee, um, I didn't sign up for that." Anyway, what you're seeing there is is um, a is window dressing, right? You got a Latina president of Cal State San Marcos or Fresno, whatever it is, but she's. Um, she is uh, really someone who's um, wearing an ethnic costume, all right, uh, saying everything's okay here. You know, we're going to have free access to all the Latinas who will be our first generation shock troops, putting them through, uh, putting and inserting them to the judiciary through all the different uh, institutions so that we can go full globalist with, within the next generation. All right. So here's how we can, it's very, it's very, <laughs> It's literary. I really enjoyed this set, sentence, the, the way the author <coughs> Golden sets it up here. Uh, first paragraph, let, if you'll indulge me to read this, because you know I think we need a little bit of lyricism in our lives, right? The CIA's favorite university president, page 182. On the, cri on the crisp autumn afternoon of November 26, 2007, a black car picked up Pennsylvania State University President Graham Spanier at Washington's Dulles International Airport and whisked him to CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia, using his identification card embedded with a hologram and computer chip. He checked in at security and was greeted by the chief of staff of National Resources Division, the CIA's clandestine domestic service. They proceeded to a conference room where there were about two dozen chiefs of station and other senior CIA intelligence officers awaited them. Okay, so here's his president of Penn State, and they're hanging on his every word. He's already in 2007 integral to an operation that that uh, these alpha, it's not just CIA, by the way, that is expands and expands. He's the guy that lowered the drawbridge to make it publicly acceptable and even mandatory that all universities would be an arm of uh, surveillance and uh, uh, various offshoots of the of the ideological training, including GLBTQ. Now there's disability studies. You're going to be hearing more about disability studies and. Uh, being pushed through right now, the GLBTQ has has kind of run its course. They've always got something in there. That's all been workshop at the university, and these are all uh, synthetic uh, causes and uh, shifts in scholarship and and the apportion of money, the granting of funding, and all that is contingent upon these prescripted uh, pre narratives that that's that's going to be operationalized and they're going to think these professors uh, are so genius they came up with it. no they're given the plan so you want you take this fifty thousand dollars you hire yourself some undergraduates a couple of graduate students and uh, we're going to make you the expert in disability studies or just as the previous generation was we're going to make you the expert in uh, let's call it um oh yeah how about minority discourse right but at the same time you know you're going to be our snitch you're going to be our rat you're going to be our man but you're going to have this academic distinction of being the, the leader of a movement. Call it critical race studies, whatever you want. You know, call it uh, cybernetic Latino um, uh, postmodern uh, structuralism, uh, linguistic, neurolinguistic, uh, psychic channeling. You know, that whatever. Come up with something nice and, and, and fluid and present it, and we'll fund it. We'll fund it. This is not just me making this up. There are, um, I, I'll recommend you to a book by Francis Stoner calling The Cultural Cold War. That's the title. Any number, I've already spoken of the Iowa Writers Workshop, CIA from the beginning to end, right? And I can give you multiple examples. So, you know, indulge my little flights of fancy here because they're rooted in truth and um, in scholarship, right? You don't have to listen to me. You read these books yourself and you'll, you'll come to uh, similar conclusions. So Spanier was... Um, um, going to give them a briefing. All these heads of station of CIA, this nerdy uh, corn-fed boy from Iowa, you know, from the mid Midwest, CIA man. He grew up like with me, James, worshiping James Bond, right? He probably wishes he had as many, you know, women that James Bond did. Except in his case, it was probably more like boys. But you get my point, 
you know he was at the at the top of his game he was you know he could do he could not fall from that high perch that they placed him no way by the way hang on to the end of this talk because i'm trying to build a suspense here you know where this is going to go you know what's going to happen to spanier you're too smart but i'm going to give you the details it's it's kind of interesting uh, so he gets a little medal, right? There's nothing that uh, some French general said. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible what people will do in order for to get a piece of ribbon, right? They'll they'll kill themselves in uh, World War One or sacrifice their lives. Uh, and th again, that's not to denigrate the people who went into battle having zero understanding of what what was really going on here, who was behind it. So he got a little medal. It said, to Dr. Graham B. Spanier, for your outstanding contribution to the national security of the United States of America. Thank you from a grateful nation. Well, they fit that all on a little gold coin size medallion. So there you go. <clears throat> Here's a description of him provided by Golden. Um, the honor recognized Spaniard's dedication to alerting college administrators to the threat of human and cyber espionage. It's not even espionage, it's cyber espionage. And to opening doors for the agency at campuses nationwide. A former family therapist and talk show, I'm sorry, a former family therapist and television talk show host with an unruffled empathetic manner and features round face, white hair, blue eyes, reminiscent of Phil Donahue, Spanier soothed many an academic's anxiety about dealing with the CIA and FBI. Did you hear that? He's a former family therapist, right? He's a former television talk show host. He became the president of Pennsylvania State University. Oh my gosh. Right. And you can trust your family therapist. They're only taking notes and entering into a central database and trying to figure out how they're going to get your children away from you and put them into child protective services where they'll probably experience years and years of sexual trauma. Not probably, perhaps. All right. That's not an uncommon pattern. I don't want to scare people away from availing yourself of these servers. I'm just giving you the heads up of how these institutions work in practice. So that's his world, television talk show. You can trust the television talk show host. I mean, Oprah Winfrey, whenever I see Oprah Winfrey on TV, I just get on the floor and I bow. I, you know, I, I just say, oh my gosh, the world is so much better with a black woman too. And she's so wise, just like the, like, like Whoopi Goldberg. She always plays the wise black woman who's the spiritual advisor to the heroine who's usually white, right? Because, you know, Supposedly, white people don't have a spirit tradition. I'm being ironic. They do. Everybody does, including me. Uh, but you got Whoopi Goldberg and you got, uh, you know, St. Oprah Winfrey, right? Oprah, I think that's a deity from some sort of, a, you know, uh, some sort of cult, a cargo cult. I don't know. So he's from that world. And Phil Donahue, yeah, you know, remember him? He was, he's a liberal, too, and he's married to my girl or that girl, Marlo Thomas. And, uh, you know, all the way to uh, Larry, uh, Larry King. I mean, the guy works in shirt sleeves and his suspenders. I mean, they're not all dickheads like Bill O'Reilly. I mean, not that he's had it. Has he had an auction? Maybe he has. I don't know. Um, they're like Johnny Carson. You know, he's Johnny Carson also comes from the Midwest, uh, Nebraska. Right. So the reasoning that. Um, uh, Spaniard gives is that since the intelligence agencies are going to be meddling in campus uh, internal affairs anyway and spying on on uh, on uh, faculty researchers and administrators, then he might as well be party to it. So then we'll not be surprised. So that at least he can manage it. And that's a variation of the old uh, theme uh, that oh yeah, I'm going to work from the inside, right? I'm going to change. I'm going to be a change agent from within. I'm not going to be outside the gates and just kind of yell and scream and rant. I'm going to work on the inside. And ladies and gentlemen, if you believe that, um, you're heading for a big fall. At minimum, you're going to be disappointed, especially <laughs> if you start making some gains. Then they're going to come down and you like a sack of bricks, right? So um, that's his uh, rationalization. 
He was especially alarmed by the events of 9-11 uh, that, that you know, had multiple, the, the event of 9-11, a synthetic event by many accounts, uh, had a, a number of different effects. And one of it was to bust open the university to say, listen, man, we're surrounded by these terrorists. They're all over the place. You got to let us in so we know that the, these terrorists are not studying at your institution. So they found this guy down at the University of South Florida. His name was uh, Professor Sami al Arian. This is during the mid 90s, 95, around that time. And uh, I don't, you know, I kind of know this particular the case. Whether he was guilty or not, I'm not going to even address. But they focused on him, the mainstream media. They said he's a security threat. And uh, Spanier said, okay, that's not going to happen here at Penn State. There will be no scandal of any sort of sort of consequence here on my watch. So FBI, CIA, ONI, Mossad, Surete, uh, Canadian intelligence, uh, MI6, come on in, come on in. It's an open, and Chinese uh, uh, intelligence and espionage as well. Because if you're inside the university, we don't have to meet you anywhere. We can just hand it right over to your grad students who you place here, right? It's a transfer of knowledge, which is illegal and illicit, but you can chalk it up to espionage or lax security to get this information out that we're, that, that we're gonna hand out anyway. So uh, they like him, Spanier, the security agencies. They like him to the extent that he became the chair of what is called the National Security Higher Education Advisory Board. National Security Higher Education Advisory Board. Advisory. This was established in 2005. It ran for about 12, 13 years. It disbanded in 2018. But the board... This advisory board consisted of about 20 to 25 university presidents around the country and higher education leaders, according to the author here, Golden. And some of them were a little bit uh, anxious about their, their involvement with this uh, advisory board being public. But today, that wouldn't be an issue, especially after 9-11. Right. Most of your university presidents have been read in to the larger fusion of uh, Wall Street, the city of London and uh, Geneva and the central world banks. And they realize how little they are, even if they're pulling down a quarter million salary a, a year, plus benefits, perks, free housing, you know, transportation, you name it. It, it, it probably runs up into the. Uh, low millions uh, for your average uh, research one uh, institution. I think Linda Katehi here, who comes from Greek originally, and played on her. Oh yeah, I'm a foreign, you know, woman in a in a new system, and she was handpicked when she's from the time she was a kid. But she was pulling down like 750k. That's just her base salary, and she hung on as long as she could. And um, she and I, you know, through our pro. She sent her proxies after me. I went, you know, one on one on them. She could never face me directly, although I did get an audience from Queen um, Katehi once, and she realized that she she could not really handle me uh, altogether. So they had to bring uh, the attorneys from uh, headquarters, run by Janet Napolitano, who came from Department of Homeland Security, who was the former boss of Phil Haney. Right? Phil Haney has something in common. Not that he's dead and I'm going to be dead. I will be dead at some point. You know, I know that. Um, but what we have in common is that we both had the same boss, Janet Napolitano. And then she's gone. She left before I did, I think. All right. Um, anyway, you've heard, heard me talk about it yet in times past. Hey, if you want to see a classic video, go on my channel. There's a, It's in the uh, playlist, Professor Hamamoto channel, that is. Playlist, and there's an interview with uh, Lauren Moray, and it's about uh, Linda Katehi uh, in specific. So that gives you a little bit of a story. And that video alone has, has uh, 70,000 views. And the original one went viral almost overnight. It had over 100,000. That was on another channel. I took that, and since I'm in this video, I put it on my channel so that you can see it. And it still gets comments. So I, if you want to get a, a, a more insight into into that time of my life. I've, I've moved on uh, past that, uh, thank goodness. But if you want to get some insight, you, I can recommend you watch that interview. It's a long one, but you'll be well rewarded. Now, okay, so you've got uh, President um, Spanier 
riding high, addressing CIA station chiefs and getting a black limousine service uh, from Dulles uh, Airport to uh, Langley headquarters and going to all these different uh, conferences and meetings and being looked to as an exemplar of this new relationships to developing between the spy agencies and higher education, which had been on the outs for, for at least a generation. You have them there. However, you might remember Penn State University, which Spanier was president of, right? I can't remember the exact years of his, his uh, tenure there as president. But his uh, administration did coincide when all the sexual skullduggery was taking place right seemingly under his nose, right? You know the name Jerry Sandusky. You know the name Joe Pa, Joe Paterno, right? It was Sandusky that was sent to prison. Joe Pa just suffered some humiliation and maybe had a couple of playoff games and maybe was banned by the NCAA for a season or so. Uh, but Penn State football was not – <laughs> not the big name it was after that. I don't know if it hurt the recruiting or why I don't follow football at the pro or the um, or the amateur levels. Not that that doesn't affect my life. I realize it's really part of the the nat uh, the national pastime in America. <clears throat> but I don't know the particulars. All I do know is that uh, this scandal happened on the watch of Graham Spanier. So as he was opening the door to these alphabet agencies so that we can watch out for all these spies. I'm not saying there aren't spies. There are tons of them all around. This book documents a couple of them here. Um, but it's not as cut and dry as one nation against another. For example, I, you know, I, as I said, uh, graduate students are kind of like uh, walking USBs or th thumb drives. You don't have to give them a uh, get a USB and put it in a dead drop someplace in a park. You can just train your graduate student from some country X, Y, or Z, and then send him home or he goes on vacation or one of his friends come here and then they can exchange information that way. And that, and by that process, the Pentagon slash NATO can keep on this spy versus spy um, melodrama. Not that it's not a huge consequence to our health and welfare and even our lives, right? Especially if you're exchanging vials of X, Y, or Z, right? Uh, but that's how it's done. And, and uh, Golden, um, in an otherwise brilliant book and well-researched piece of um, journalistic reportage, he, he misses that, that subtle connection there, that they're all in the same game here. Even Spanier didn't realize it. Um, so while he was distracted in this area, being fated by the FBI and the CIA, getting gold medallions, this scandal was unfolding. And I won't say that he had full knowledge of it. But there is some court testimony uh, attesting to the fact that he did get some complaints by football players, athletes, students, young people, or their parents, and he swept it under the rug. And you know what happened. To come 2011, the whole kettle uh, started to boil over. And uh, the university and the, the state of Pennsylvania and public sentiment required a, a scapegoat, so they uh, got wrapped up Je Jerry Sandusky, not to minimize his his uh, criminal offenses. He's been convicted, right? So I'm not just saying that he's criminal. He's been convicted by a jury of his peers. And guess who else was convicted of a misdemeanor? Yes, President Graham Spanier, because he uh, neglected. It, it was a misdemeanor charge. It wasn't a criminal charge, but uh, he could have gotten worse. You know, he must have had a good lawyer or he'd been promised a deal. I don't know what the circumstances are, but he did spend a couple of months in prison. And I think supervised release. He didn't. I don't know if he had a monetary damages award or he was sued by parents. Uh, that's the strategy I would have taken if I was a parent. Maybe he did. Uh, I don't know. Maybe he was sued. I, I'm not sure. But he got out fairly lightly for what he was overseeing. Now, this is what doesn't make it into the Golden Book. Uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the book by Golden. All right, just so there's no one misunderstanding here. This is what he misses, and this is speculation on my part, and I admit to that, right? I'm going on the assumption that uh, Spanier knew about uh, the Afib grooming process by the intelligence agencies, and I'm assuming that Spanier knew 
that Jerry Sandusky was involved with a wider wing, a ring rather, of a Phoeb uh, slash patron relationships. So he was, you know, being a procure in the more vulgar terms, vulgar terms, a pimp between these uh, strapping young men, you know, who are athletically fit, right? They're ideal athletic specimens. They're elite division one football players. My gosh, you know, they would look really good in butt tight Bermuda shorts and a, and a tight muscle shirt and Sperry topsiders with little anklet socks and in a facial recognition Ray-Bans, right? They would be, they would look perfectly at home in that setting and would also be perfectly at home working in these security agencies. So this is what Spanier in, in truth was involved with. He was involved with the scandal at Penn State centered around one Jerry Sandusky and there were any number of people that might have been involved. No names here because I'm only talking about people who've been convicted in a court of law, right? And guess who was um, the independent investigator who was hired by the Penn State trustees? It was none other than former head of the FBI, Louis Free, the same Louis Free who had given Spanier a, an autographed copy of his autobiography. I'm talking about Louis Free, talk, you know, inscribing it to his dear friend. And, you know, they knew each other when, when Free was on the other side. Was, he was on the FBI, you know. Uh, he was maybe assistant, but he was up there. And Spanier thought he was running high. So they were buddies. But what happened? Penn State hired Lou, the same Louis Free after he left FBI service, government service, as an investigator. And Louis Free, in a report, dumped on his ex-friend Spanier, Graham Spanier. He just really, um, really put him to the ringer. Now, let me read from the book, page 189. Free's July, I'm talking about Louis Free, Free's July 2012 report portrayed Spanier quite differently. It accused him of concealing the sex, child sex abuse allegations from trustees and authorities. Let me read that sentence again. It accused him of concealing the child sex abuse allegations from trustees and authorities and exhibiting, quote, a striking lack of empathy, end of quote, for victims. Spanier denied the allegations and sued Free and Penn State separately, contending that they had scapegoated him. And anyway, there was a, you know, back and forth in the courts that ensued. But I found an article that was published in 2020 saying that after appeal, um, uh, the upshot is that is that the conviction held and the penalty held where it concerns uh, Graham Spanier. You know, he had to get his slap on the wrist, and I guess he'll carry a criminal conviction on his on his resume. And it's probably not likely that he's going to ever uh, be a college or university president. Gosh, maybe he can get a job as a consultant from some law enforcement agency. So here's the conclusion. See, I told you there was going to be a, a, a grand uh, finale wrapping it all up and and justice. There is justice here, even though uh, there were some crimes, serious crimes being committed where it concerns children and ephebes, right? They didn't try them on pedophilia. These guys were 18, 19, 20, so they were technically adults, but they, they were exploited. Not just as football players, but as sexual playthings, I, I believe. Um, so here's um, the conclusion by Golden, which I wholeheartedly agree with, with one exception. He says that after Spanier and all the other college and university presidents opened the door for openly and to cultivate and cultivated this relationship with the um, so-called intelligence agencies, that was the beginning of the end. Um, the intelligence agencies, contrary to what they claim, do not view the university as sacred ground. Every place is ripe for infiltration and corruption and for subversion and for being overturned. And the university in America, I'm just speaking of this country alone, maybe in other countries the same, has been taken over by NATO, by the Pentagon, by the alphabet agencies. And all you see about GLBTQ, disability studies, and whatever the the um, the trend du jour in academic circles is, these are all orchestrated. This is Iowa work, uh, Writers Workshop by the alphabet agencies. So if you're going to be spending fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 per year to send your uh, adult son or daughter into this particular institution, 
maybe you should read the Golden Book, and may, may, maybe you should read the, the earlier one that you does about uh, elite education and admissions process, and ask yourself if it's worth spending that much money to support a corrupt system that's going to screw you over. And if not that, they're going to take your son or daughter and pimp them out to one of these agencies, right? They're going to put him in butt-type Bermuda shorts, a, a tight muscle shirt, uh, Sperry top siders and Ray Ban glasses, and if he just came out of the Marines, you'll be seeing him rocking the high and tight hairdo. That's Marine all the way. Semper Fi, baby. Okay, the only part that I disagree with in his concluding remarks, Golden saying that, you know, it's really not that effective to hire these nerdy people who are professors because it's a low risk tenured position, and they're they're not willing to. Uh, stick their neck out for anything. That's true for 99% of any population, including academia, but that's obviously not true in, in all cases, right? And to say it's a low risk position is a mischaracterization. I conclude, ladies and gentlemen, with this uh, link for you, not literally a link, but check out this article by Steve Quayle. In fact, I'll, I'll post link on my Patreon. That's one of the many services, extra services and attention I give to the Patreon subscribers. I'll post that to my link, but you'll have a whole list, an entire long list of dead scientists that I believe was initially maintained by Steve Quayle, uh, an independent investigator. And I'll I think you'll be amazed, if you haven't already seen the list, at the dangers that most, if not many, I'm sorry, many, if not most professors, especially in the sciences and researchers, un albeit unwittingly, they don't know the, the danger that they're running into, that they incur, this danger that they incur by acquiring, developing valuable patents that could be worth hundreds of millions of dollars during the life of the patent, and they own it, right? and gathering priceless information about the different emerging technology, like the invisibility cloak that uh, Mr. Golden talks about here that was stolen and take, not only stolen, it was much like transferred from US to China so everybody can you know, enjoy the new technology, right? They're, they're taking enormous risks. They just don't know uh, what these risks are and uh, many of them have wound up dead. And uh, a, there was a huge spike in these deaths for people who were doing Guess what? Biological research for the last couple of years. You know what? I think I'm going to um, uh, deal a little bit more extensively on this list of dead scientists because that's in my field. These are all mostly not, you know, 90 percent of I think are, come from an academic point, uh, institutional uh, background. Right. So I'm going to kind of go through that and see if you and I can come up with some patterns that, that are emerging here. And thank uh, Steve Quayle, um, who is an independent researcher. He's not mainstream by, by any means. And forget about what reservations you might have about the Anunnaki and the giants and whatever. Read it all. Take, check it all out. Because there's there's a uh, just a wealth of information coming from unconventional sources. And that is a credo that I have observed and followed religiously ever since I hit Bowling Green State University in 1976. Read it all. Look at everything. Um, all the different accounts, they, they, are, they are all collective, individually and collectively helpful in um, understanding these, these, these mechanisms of power that are otherwise difficult for most people to fathom, to understand, to imagine. So I thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining me today and uh, listening to me talking a mile a minute with a whole range of uh, information and insights and analytical perspectives that I hope you will run this video back again and watch it with your friends and neighbors and family and try to uh, assimilate it. You know, I know I realize it's, it's, it's a difficult process. And better yet, read the Golden Book. I recommend it. Next Thursday, I'll have a whole new set of insights for you. I don't know if I'll get to this one. I'm working on uh, uh, Roman Polanski in general, just, just for your information. And uh, I appreciate you again. Thermobstrophal, Swan 432 frequencies. Uh, Melissa, ECAT, yes. Um, Ham Solo, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll see you next Thursday. Again, I appreciate you being here. Bye.